Welcome to the third topic in Chapter 15, Transport Pathways. Here are the learning objectives for this topic. As usual, please get with me if you are having a hard time with these. In this section of the lecture, we are wrapping up the chapter by reviewing vescular transport with two examples, the secretory pathway and the endocytic pathway. Now that we know how proteins have been imported into the ER, it's time to talk about how these proteins and other molecules are sent to their final destination around the cell, which may be another organelle or the plasma membrane. These are transported via transport vesicles. In this section of the lecture, I'm going to review how transport works, discuss how vesicles are formed, and wrap this section up with how the vesicles dock at their destination. Proteins, either free proteins or transmembrane proteins, are moved from the ER to the Golgi for processing and are then sent out to other organelles or to the plasma membrane. These are transported via a bubble of membrane known as a transport vesicle. However, transport vesicles are used for a lot more than just protein transport. There are two main pathways in the cell that use transport vesicles, the secretory uh, pathway where things are moved out and the endocytic pathway which brings things into the cell. To create the transport vesicle a process known as budding occurs. The first thing that is required for the formation of a vesicle is the coating of the membrane. This coating is responsible for shaping the vesicle and capturing the molecules that are being transported. The most well understood vesicles are known as clathrin coated vesicles. But we are aware of other types of coats produced by the cell. Let's look at how these coats assemble and aid in budding. We start with the cargo receptors that are in the membrane of either the Golgi body or the plasma membrane. These cargo receptors bind to their specific ligands. Proteins known as adaptins bind to the receptor. These adaptins work like a bridge that allow the clathrin molecules to bind to them and through them the cargo receptors. A protein known as dynamin is then recruited to the bud which forms a ring around the neck of the bud. As it tightens down, it effectively pinches off the bud. The vesicle is then released into the cytosol where the coat is removed so that it may bind with its destin so that the vesicle may bind with its destination membrane. It is important to note that the coat does not determine what is bound to it. Instead, it is the cargo receptors that are specific for a molecule. These receptors can be recruited by the adaptins to create a group of similar receptors that will eventually create a vesicle with a specific cargo. Just as the coats can vary, so can the adaptins. This creates specificity in the transport vesicles. Now that we have released the vesicles into the cytosol, they travel along the cytoskeleton to their destination. But how do they bind to their destination? This binding is known as docking and occurs in a few steps. You can see them highlighted on the slide here. Docking relies on two specific proteins, tethers and snares. As you can imagine based on what we have just discussed, each vesicle has a unique membrane signature to help the destination membrane recognize it. This recognition depends on a class of proteins called Rab proteins. The proteins are found on the outside of the vesicle. These Rab proteins are recognized by the tethering protein. The tethering proteins help bring the vesicle closer to the destination membrane and the snares begin to interact. As you can see, the vesicle contains a V snare and the destination membrane has a T snare. These snares will interact together to facilitate docking. We have now brought the vesicle to the membrane, but how do we get the two separate entities to fuse? How do we go from two separate entities to one final membrane? This process is called fusion. 
When fusion occurs, not only does the cargo get delivered to the destination, but the membrane of the vesicle is now incorporated into the membrane of the destination. For fusion to occur, the two membranes must be very, very close. This causes the fluid lipids of the membranes to mix. The displacement of water help, during this mixing helps ensure this doesn't happen randomly. The snare proteins then help these unfavorable reactions occur. As you can see from the picture on the slide, the snares help interact with each other and pull the vesicle close enough to displace the water and have the, inner, the lipids interact with each other. Now that we understand how vesicles move between compartments, let's wrap up our lecture by reviewing the two major pathways of the cell. The secretory or secretory pathway is the pathway utilized by the cell to move things out of the cell. This pathway generally goes from the ER to the Golgi to the cell membrane. The other pathway is the endocytic pathway, which uses vesicles to bring items into the cell. These vesicles will then go to the lysosomes via the endosomes. The secretory pathway is used to send proteins or other molecules to the plasma membrane. Sometimes you will hear this pathway referred to as exocytosis, but this is only when the pathway terminates in fusion of a vesicle to the plasma membrane. Let's look at this system following a protein bound for the plasma membrane. In the, this pathway, we have four major stages. Modification of the protein in the ER, the secretion from the ER, the modification and sorting in the Golgi body, and finally the exocytosis of the protein to the plasma membrane. We usually think of protein modifications only occurring in the Golgi body, but most proteins that enter the ER are actually modified there as well. Modified there as well. Some of these modifications are glycosylation and the formation of disulfide bonds. The formation of disulfide bonds can change the shape of the protein, and in the ER, this is created through the oxidation of cysteine side chains. This change in conformation can make it more stable for environments outside of the cell. Glycos glycosylation is the addition of carbohydrates to the extracellular side of the protein. This process is facilitated by enzymes only located in the ER lumen. The carbohydrate is built inside the ER and is attached to a specialized lipid. These serve as the staging area for the carbohydrate. On proteins, the typical site for glycosylation is an asparagine. Once this amino acid enters the lumen, an enzyme known as oligosaccharide protein transferase moves the carbohydrate to the growing protein. This 14 sugar carbohydrate will then serve as the basis for the unique modifications made in the Golgi body. Once the protein has been appropriately modified, it is ready for excretion from the ER. This process is controlled to ensure that only properly folded proteins are allowed to leave the ER. To help ensure that proper folding occurs or that multimeric protein structures have been formed, chaperone proteins will remain bound to the proteins until they are properly folded. If the chaperone never releases the protein, it will eventually be degraded. However, when, cro when correct proteins are released, they will bind to the receptors in the membrane and bud off as we discussed earlier. These vesicles are bound for the Golgi body to be further processed. The Golgi body is the next to receive the proteins. The vesicle will always be received on the cyst side of the organelle, which is the side facing toward the nucleus. When the vesicle fuses with the Golgi, it joins the long network of interconnecting tubes that make up the stacks of the cisternae. These stacks look somewhat like a pile of plates. On the plasma side of the Golgi is the transface. This is where the vesicles bound for the plasma membrane bud off and begin their journey. But let's back up to the protein entering the Golgi. When the vesicle fuses with the cyst side of the Golgi, the Golgi can determine if a protein was sent from the ER that was meant to stay in the ER. These proteins are then returned to the ER. If the proteins are where they are supposed to be, they continue through 
the cisternae, budding off from one plate and fusing to the next. As they pass through the Golgi, their destination is determined and they are directed in specific directions. The carbohydrate that was added in the ER continues to be modified so that it has the proper shape and function upon reaching its destination. Once reaching the trans face of the Golgi, a new vesicle is formed and the protein continues on its path. Note that not all proteins leaving the Golgi are destined for the plasma membrane. This is just one example that we are using. There are two types of exocytosis that occurs in the cell. The first of these is the constitutive secretion pathway. This, in this pathway, molecules to be released to the outside of the cell or secreted are made and sent to the plasma membrane on a continual basis. The second pathway is the regulated secretion pathway. In this pathway, molecules that are made regularly are sequestered within a certain area of the Golgi, either by pH or by other means. These molecules are then put into vesicles that are exported to an area near the plasma membrane. Then, when the appropriate signal is received, these vesicles are released into the extracellular space. An example of this is insulin secretion from the cells in the pancreas. Vesicles full of insulin are packaged and await the signal of high blood glucose to release the insulin, which is utilized in the rest of the body. Don't forget that while these transport vesicles deliver molecules for the membrane, extracellular matrix, or for cell signaling, these vesicles also supply new plasma membrane lipids through the fusion of the vesicles. Our other pathway is the endocytic pathway. In this pathway, we bring items into the cell. There are three main mechanisms for endocytic pathways. Phagocytosis, cellular eating, pinocytosis, cellular drinking, and receptor-mediated endocytosis, specific transport. These processes utilize endocytic vesicles and endosomes, both of which we will talk about shortly. Let's first look at the three processes of bringing molecules into the cell, then we will discuss how these processes are regulated. Let's start out with phagocytosis. This is the process we have referenced when, we, when discussing the endosymbiont theory. This process is quite easy to observe. You can literally watch the cell engulf a large object. When these objectives are engulfed, the cell uses a vesicle known as a phagosome. These phagosomes fuse with lysosomes and, using the acidic environment and the enzymes inside the lysosome, break down the object into basic building blocks that can be used by the cell. You might be thinking right now that it seems odd to think of our skin cells performing this activity, and you are right. A majority of our cells lack the ability to phagocytize large molecules around them. Instead, they use extracellular mechanisms, enzymes and such, to break these molecules down into molecules that are small enough to be transported into the cell. However, we do have specialized white blood cells that can perform this function. The most well-known cell is the macrophage, which can engulf an entire bacterium as a part of the efforts of the immune system to clear an infection. I'll put some videos on macrophages up on Blackboard so you can watch this incredible process. The next ingestion method is called pinocytosis or cellular drinking. In contrast to phagocytosis, this process occurs quite frequently. It takes in little bits of the surrounding environment through the creation of endocytic vesicles. This process acts as a balancing act to exocytosis as exocytosis adds to the membrane and releases cytosol and other intracellular molecules into the extracellular matrix. The cell continually brings in liquid and removes the membrane added by exocytosis. Once again, I've put a video for you on Blackboard so that you can see this in action. The last way of internalizing extracellular components is through receptor-mediated endocytosis. This process is as specific as pinocytosis and phagocytosis is not. This process is very similar to pinocytosis and can actually occur simultaneously in the same vesicle. How this works is that the membrane contains areas called clathrin-coated pits. 
These pits are indentations in the plasma membrane that have clathrin molecules on the internal side of the membrane, where the ligand for the receptor binds to the receptor, the, prodding, the budding process we discussed earlier starts to happen. These vesicles then lose their, their coat and fuse to the endosome. These receptors help concentrate the desired macromolecule being brought into the cell. So now that we have brought these items into the cell, how are they handled? The first stage is the sorting of these molecules by the endosome. The endosomes are the destination of clathrin-coated vesicles and endocytic vesicles. After fusion, the molecules are, that are carried by the vesicle is released into the endosome and the receptors or lipid membranes are recycled back to the membrane or sent to the lysosome for degradation. The endosome is much like the Golgi body in that it is a series of tubes that uses pH and other mechanisms to help sort the proteins that need to be sent to various compartments within the cell. Most of the contents of the endosome is destined for destruction within the lysosome, and that's where we are headed next. The lysosome is the final destination for all items that need to be digested in the cell. You can see on this slide how all three endocytic pathways end at the lysosome. These compartments are very acidic, usually around uh, 5 pH, and contain a large amount of enzymes that help break down all of, these all of these molecules into usable building blocks. To maintain the strongly acidic environment, the lysosome utilizes a hydrogen pump to pump hydrogen ions into the organelle. Well, this is the end of chapter 15. Let me know if you have any questions about the material.